Welcome to our first Faculty Ethics Roundtable of the Year, brought to you by the Daniel Spun Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program at UCCS College of Business. I'm also known as DFEI, so if I say DFEI, that's what we're talking about. We're very excited to have Faye Harold here leading the discussion. Faye Harold is Principal Instructor in the Technical Communication and Information Design Program at UCCS. She teaches Advanced Professional and Technical Writing and Technical Editing and serves as a teaching fellow for the LAS Faculty Resource Center. She specializes in online pedagogy and designing accessible courses with high impact teaching strategies. Uh, her project uh, started last year and the curricular goal was to replace one of the existing analysis focused units with one that encourages students to take a closer look at ethical decision making as it relates to technical communication. The students examined intentional use of plain language and the effect on specific communities ethical decision-making when considering visual rhetoric and understanding how the value we ascribe to elements of the rhetorical situation affect our communication decisions. Today, you will help uncover opportunities for making ethical decisions in technical communication. We're gonna first walk through the writing process, something I know you all are familiar with. In fact, if I could pull together the collective number of writing experiences that just you guys have in this room, it would be probably great um, and amazing because you all have very different writing experiences. We'll touch on a few things in the writing process that make the technical communication process maybe a little different than say the fiction writing process. And then we're gonna explore what I'm calling a mini case study because we don't have that much time today. We're gonna look at the Challenger Space Shuttle, its destruction, um, the opportunities for ethical communication that preceded the launch of that shuttle. But before we get started, and you can roll to the, or I guess I'm, I'm rolling to the slides today, all right. Um, we'll start today by giving a quick definition of what is technical communication, and we'll also get a working definition of ethics. Technical communication is different from other kinds of writing for a, few, for a few reasons. First of all, it is designed. We don't often think of writing as something that we design, but for technical communicators, that's a pretty part, uh, important part of the process. Second, it is designed for a specific audience. It's not for everyone and everywhere all at once. It's for a specific audience. I know that's your favorite one. <laughs> um, and finally, and this is most important, it's written to help that audience complete a specific task or make a decision or take action. So when I define technical communication for my students, I focus on those three areas. It is designed communication, it's for a specific audience, and it is to help that audience. And you might hear me say today, audience, reader, user, viewer, we use all of those words. It's to help them take action of some kind. Uh, maybe it's helping them make a decision that has to do with what to do in an emergency. Maybe they need to assess a health situation. Maybe they're learning how to understand equipment. Or maybe they're learning how to abide by some guidelines on a public beach. Technical writing helps us do a lot of things in our everyday life. Um, so in the program in which I teach technical communication and information design classes, they can focus on a lot of different things that have to do with communication design, audience analysis, using plain language and style, editing, focusing on visual rhetoric, information architecture and navigation have a lot to do with how we organize information, and usability and accessibility have to do with how are people able to access and use that information? Is what we've created actually doing the job it needs to do? You're gonna see these words come up throughout the writing and design process um, that we'll walk through in just a minute. And each of these choices you'll discover today can lead to some choices that are have ethical implications, whether we're thinking about it or not. And now for a quick definition of ethics. There can be some confusion about what ethics means in terms of ethics and morals. What's the difference? And so I know that when talking to students about it, I kind of draw the line that morals is personally the decisions that I make. They may be very similar to some of the 
the ethical decisions and, and things that we'll look at today, the Daniel Fund Ethics Initiative, this principle-based code of ethics might look like morals to you, but the difference is ethics has to do with principles of conduct governing a group for the most part. I like this definition here, questions of correct behavior within a relatively narrow area of activity. We think about and we hear the terms professional ethics, corporate ethics, organizational ethics. So these are the decisions that are made that are within a specific context of a group. Now UCCS has a code of ethics. And so I just pulled a little bit from the website here. I'm not gonna read it, but it's proof. We have ethics that guide our behaviors here on campus. Um, I'm gonna roll on over. The Society for Technical Communicators which is an industry organization for technical writers. They have a principle-based code of ethics, similar to that of the Daniels Fund. And IEEE, which is the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, they have a code of ethics as well. So I've pulled, I've cherry-picked actually, <laughs> a couple from their um, code of ethics because these are really going to shape some of the things that we're gonna think about towards the end of my presentation when we look at the Challenger case study and we think about the actions of some of the major players um, in that case study. Roger Beaujolais, an engineer who wrote a memo that you have in front of you and that we'll look at. Um, and then the actions of Morton Thiokol, an engineering firm whom he worked for, and then NASA. And ultimately the decision to launch when we take that back to some of these um, ethical codes, we can start to ask some questions about were they acting ethically or not? So the things I've bolded here, I'll point out, oftentimes in principle-based codes of ethics, you will see a reference to decisions made for the public good. Making a decision, not just for me, not just for you, but overall, this should have an effect that helps the most number of people. The safety, health, and welfare of the public is a goal of um, engineers to disclose promptly any factors that might endanger the public or the environment. Another one that I pulled is to be honest and realistic in stating any claims or estimates based on available data. And then another one down here, to support colleagues and coworkers in following a code of ethics and to not retaliate against individuals who report a violation. Those are gonna be important to keep in mind as we walk through our case study today. So the Daniels Fund um, principle-based ethics code you have in front of you on some small cards, so if that makes them easier to read, what I wanted to do is to get your voices out in the room before we move along any further. And perfect, there's eight of you and there are eight principles. Just wanna go around and one of you say uh, one out loud and then we'll move to the next person. So we'll start right here. If you'll just read the first one and then we'll go to the next person. Integrity, act with honesty in those situations. Trust, build trust in all stakeholder relationships. Accountability, accept responsibility for all decisions. Transparency, maintain open and truthful communications. Fairness, engage in fair competition and create equitable and just relationships. Respect, honor the rights, freedoms, means, and property of others. Rule of law, combine the spirit and intent of law with Liability, create long term value for all relevant stakeholders. All right, thank you. We're going to keep those in mind as we now walk through, this is so exciting, walking through the writing process, guys. <laughs> you showed up today to walk through the writing process. I can't believe that. <laughs> so also in front of you, and I think this is the sheet that's on the bottom that has color. Um, these, I'm going to click over to where I have some slides that walk through the process. You can pull it up on your phone if you want to, um, but I'm just gonna click right here and take us to the writing process. Um, so this is organized on a page, it's called a Padlet. And so basically as I scroll through, 
um, we'll, we'll walk through the writing process basically it has three parts, right? We've got planning, and I have three areas that um, are part of planning. We've got writing and design. We'll take a look at those. And then finally, reviewing, uh, we'll talk about what happens in that part of the tech talk writing process. So as I mentioned before, considering who we write for audience, it's not unique to technical communication, but the process by which technical writers analyze, research, and study their audiences is specialized. Technical writers anticipate not only who their readers are, but also what actions their readers are taking and where in that sequence of actions they might need information or guidance or safety warnings. We also decide how much information do they need it or do they need and in what form should that information be. Technical writers might create things like a journey map. They might do field research. They might develop personas and gather demographic data, all to help determine who their writers might be. I'm going to click over and just show you one example of how we anticipate um, our readers. This should, let's see, is it in this thing? Yes. The Nielsen Norman Group, as it says, world leaders in research based user experience. Uh, that's a resource we use a lot in our courses. So I am going to pull this up. And this is an example of a persona. I know you probably can't read the details from back in the back of the room, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about what this is. First of all, is anyone familiar with personas that someone might create in? Do you want to give a description as to what a persona is, Dylan? It's basically a summary. You do a lot of research on your own user, um, then you use, you find out those things, and then you just summarize who they are in one kind of native persona. And then that kind of gives um, everyone in the process a quick reference for who they're creating for. So. Great. That was a very good definition of, of a persona. Mm -hmm. um, this is a fictional person, all right? So it's important to keep that in mind. This particular example is a uh, pull from a company is redesigning their hiring or careers page. And they want to figure out who is visiting our page, who do we anticipate visiting, and why are they visiting, and what are their goals when they land on this page on our website? So they've identified a couple of different fictional people that they have determined would make up their personas. Typically, not just one persona, maybe three to five personas might be developed for a project like this. This one they called the company investigator. That's the role that they think this type of person would play visiting their site. Rosa, they give her an age, is 34, a content strategist. They tell us a little bit about, about Rosa. Again, all of this is fictional, but it's anticipating who this person could be. We know her behavioral considerations, frustrations that she has, her goals and tasks. Some examples of some things on here that, again, I probably can't read from where you are. Behavioral considerations. She expects the site that she's visiting to reflect the business culture and values. Um, she thoroughly compares multiple companies and similar opportunities. What are some of her frustrations? She thinks that too many companies have career sections that just talk about the positions, but not why someone would actually want to work there. So they're gonna think about this person and they're gonna redesign that page to try to make it better for her because they want someone like her to consider their company and work for them. So that's one example of the kind of research that one might do um, for technical work. So are there any hidden ethics in identifying who are all the audiences. One might say that you can never know, uh, truly know your audience, as much research as you might do. Can you truly know who they are and what they need? In this example, I'm referring to the writing process, identifying your audience, and I'm gonna throw out an ethical principle, accountability. I'm gonna say that in this part of the writing process, the technical communicator, no matter how much they might do to anticipate their audience, if they miss some key things, they're still accountable. 
and they need to be held accountable for what they may have missed in that part of their work. So again, in this example that I'm giving to you, identifying your audience, accountability, those are important and that's where there may be some hidden ethics. So I'm gonna roll through a little bit more of the writing process and then I'm gonna turn it over to you and ask if you can use some of the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative principles and tie them to some areas in the writing process. This will be kind of a general dive into where ethics may be hiding. And then we'll, when we look at a specific context in our mini case study, then it will be probably even easier to pick out some places where ethics may be hiding. The next part of the writing process is gathering information, picking our sources. What do we use? How current should those sources be? Why should I use this source over another one? Can I verify the information from the source in any way? There's a lot of questions that we ask when we choose our sources. Who will our users find trustworthy? If they're seeing that I pulled this information from a specific place, are they going to do their due diligence and find this trustworthy? Am I establishing ethos as a writer in picking some credible sources? Some of the key questions or things that one might consider when they're selecting sources in technical writing. They might look at the authority of the source itself. Is it accurate? Objectivity? Is it an objective source? How many of you have ever found information on a web page, not really been familiar with the web page itself, and then you're like, this is interesting information, how, how do I know if I can trust this? Where do you go on the website to figure out, to start get, to get your first clues? Does anyone have a suggestion? Where might you go to first find out? Is this credible? Or to their is it objective? What was that? To their sources. You can look to see if they've given you some sources. You can go to their about page and read about them. I always like to see who's donating, who's given them money to do this. That helps me determine if, if something may or may not have um, objective uh, viewpoints. Is the information current? How current does it need to be for what I'm writing? Um, and who was the information written for in this context that I'm pulling to put in something for my readers? Those are some questions we might ask. Um, and the last part of the planning phase is determining your purpose. Why are we writing? Do I have more than one purpose or goal? Is one of my purposes really direct and clear? Maybe I have some other purposes that I want to be implicit or somehow indirect. We can do that. We have the power to do that when we write. What do my readers need and what do they not need? Those questions I can answer once I figure out who my, what my purpose is. So before, oh, and one of my favorite sayings about writing, that's been attributed to so many people having had said it that I didn't even attribute it to anyone on this uh, slide. Do not write so that others can understand you. Write so they cannot misunderstand you. I love that phrase because it reminds us to go back and check and check again and think about it from all these other angles. We don't wanna be misunderstood. So I'm gonna pause right here in the writing process and I'm gonna throw it out to you to think about the, um, Daniel Sloan Ethics Initiative principles and see where would you possibly tie some to these parts of the writing process. From you guys now, you're doing the uncovering today. So anywhere you can pick one of these and say, I could imagine this being part of this part of the process and tell us why. Yes. So I feel like all of these come to play, but I'm gonna just address um, integrity, acting with honesty. Because I feel like if you don't act with honesty in any of your in all of your technical writing, you do run the risk of being both misunderstood and possibly doing damage to the people who are trusting you. So you'd be misunderstood and you can possibly be damaged. Yeah, right. Yes. The first one that came to my mind with respect, I think it's like when you think about identifying the audience, you also want to like not leave anybody out that, that you might think that you might not know that you know it's right so like kind of having an open mind and respecting different cultures genders whatever it might be i think in this process you have like your your writing uh part should, should start thinking about that that's so that you don't 
it's used by Biden State. Great. And even in the example I showed you, developing those personas, anticipating who our users are, we want to anticipate a diverse group of persona or of people for the most part. We don't want to exclude. And so using personas, which can feel a little like stereotyping, can be a little tough, right? There's a lot of ethical problems with using them. You can create some issues, you can solve some issues, but you can also create some issues. Yes. So I'm seeing with the, the gathering information um, application of that trust, um, making sure that your foundation is based on trust. You're looking at those information, that, that information gathering it, but that plays into integrity as well. Um, and then thinking in terms of viability for the terms of purpose. Great, find viability and purpose. For gathering information, I also really like the idea of um, transparency in terms of where your information is coming from and building that trust, that authority, and accountability um, in your application or through use of viable sources. Uh, the next part of the writing process that we'll touch on is the actual writing. Um, and my first one that I'm introducing here are our style choices. This is a lot of fun. You guys can finish this for me. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. And that is where, that's what style is, okay? From sentence length, right? How long our sentences are, to the way that they're structured, to the words that we choose, style is what makes the message. Style is what makes game instructions written for 10 year olds, different from game instructions written for adults. If you can picture those in your mind right now, what would be some differences between the two? If you can think about style and how we write things, can anyone imagine a difference between those two kinds of instructions? Vocabulary. Vocabulary, word so, choice. So yeah, and so Don't want super long sentences, for example. We don't want complex sentences. Yes, what else? More visual with the words. Think about the Lego instructions, right? All visual, not a single word. <laughs> okay, so when we think about style, um, we can think about those kinds of things. Word choice is really important when we think about style. A single word can make or break a message. Words affect people and they can do so deeply. One of the sources that I introduce to my students is something called the Conscious Style Guide. I'm going to jump over here. Anyone ever seen this website before or taken a look at it? Yes. <laughs> I shared it with you. Okay. <laughs> Style guides themselves, like MLA or APA or the Chicago Manual of Style, um, they're there to help us make consistent choices and how we punctuate, capitalize, what do we bold, how do we cite our sources. The conscious style guide, so I'm going to click over to that link, um, it was created by well-known editor, Karen Yin, and I'm going to read to you something that she put on the about page to help us understand why she created this style guide all about language. I'm going to go to the about. I'm going to scroll down. She writes, what is conscious language anyway? I coined the term conscious language to describe language that is rooted in critical thinking and compassion used skillfully in a specific context. Using conscious language involves asking yourself questions such as, what are my assumptions about my audience? Will this cause harm to historically excluded communities? How will history alter the impact of my language choices that I make today? She writes, the most important part of conscious language is the conscious part. And remember, I've already said that we sometimes make decisions and we're not aware of them. She says good writers consciously use disagreeable language to strike a dissonant tone. The goal is not to be nice or inoffensive or politically correct. Even language intended to be inclusive and considerate might offend others. If you're interested in using language consciously, then clarify your intentions and evoke and provoke skillfully. So 
This side is not about using words that are only nice. It's understanding the meanings behind the words themselves so you can use them skillfully. Language changes constantly. The meanings behind words changes constantly. So I'm going to take you around this site and I'll show you how I use it in my class. <clears throat> the site itself has guides that have lots of different. Um, let me close this little ad. Lots of different focuses. So you can go from I want to look at language that has to do with teaching children. I'm curious about language today that talks about ability and disability or age or empowerment or health. For my courses, I like to go to the plain language link. And when I get to any of these pages, there might be some featured articles at the top, but on the left-hand side, you're going to find resources that are a little more objective, things that have been compiled. So for this one, the A to Z guide to legal phrases that might be important for students in our area. How to write medical information in plain English, great resource. But on the right-hand side, this is just, in, these are writings called from the internet, all different kinds of sources that talk about language and what it means today. Um, so before, instead of clicking on some of those for you, I'm gonna take you to where my students have worked with this in the past. So I'm gonna go back to, uh, and so in my course, I've asked students to um, find some articles that, are, oh, Dylan, you're right up front there. That's amazing. <laughs> um, find some articles that are interesting to them. Write a summary, and then they could comment on the articles and kind of have some discussion about them. So what kinds of topics did students in my course um, pick? We've got accessible gaming. What's the best term for referring to old people? I struggle with that a lot. I need to go back and reread that, honestly. <laughs> um, 11 offensive phrases you didn't realize are fat shaming. Approaches to writing Jewish characters. The ultimate guide to saying no. What else did we have over here? Um, our fetus and unborn child interchangeable. We've got something about plain language. Um, Dr. He, she, or they changing gender and language in Dr. Who. Why are Americans still uncomfortable with atheism and why we should examine our culinary vocabulary? There's something here for everyone. So if you've got some interests of your own, I know you've got hobbies and whatnot, come take a look at this site and see what you can learn about um, some language choices. All right, so this is a big one, the next part of the, the writing process itself. Visual rhetoric. That's about what a document looks like. From where information is emphasized, where it's de-emphasized on a page, um, and that can be from placement, that can be from the color, that can be from the size. Deciding when to use images and what kind to use. Am I gonna use actual photos? Am I gonna use clip art? Am I gonna let AI create, as I have here, watercolor, pictures, making whatever I tell it to make. Isn't AI cool? <laughs> um, figuring out where to place those pictures. How do I label them? Is my document visually meeting accessibility criteria? Now, students in our introductory classes are introduced to what we call the CRAP principles, C-R-A-P. I'll, I'll save that funny story for later if you want to hear it. Um, but <laughs> CRAP principles stand for contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. These are some of the visual concerns we have when we look at the page and we try to make sure it looks professional. Um, in my upper level course, students take those same concepts and they add to them considering tone as it relates to the visuals on the page. Ethos, emphasis, clarity, and concision. There's a lot of things that we now think about when we talk about visual rhetoric. Some of you may re remember simpler times when writing was just writing. It was just words. I started on a little typewriter when I was little. 
<laughs> um, visual design was not something that I had to think about other than putting a title at the top and maybe remembering page numbers or maybe not. Uh, but the advent of word processing software and that being distributed to the masses and all the wonders that Microsoft Word gives us, now we are doubly responsible for our choices. It's not just what we write. It's not just how we say it. It's also how it looks on the page and how it's designed. We are now responsible for those choices too. There was a simple time when we weren't responsible for that. Someone else's job was handling how it looked. We just had to write, but now we have to do it all. I'm gonna ask, um, how many of you use Wikipedia? Like once a week, anybody use Wikipedia? Okay. Yeah, okay. I thought so. <laughs> find myself on Wikipedia a lot. Yeah, random stuff. All right, so if you've looked at Wikipedia a few times, I'm not, I don't want you to go there, but I want you to bring it up in your head. What's at the top of the page? Like, what's one thing at the very top of the page? Logo. Logo, Wikipedia, what else? It's a picture you on the right top. Yeah, we all we're all we wait we want that picture. I'm always disappointed when there's no picture. Yeah. Yeah. Or when it's not one that I want. Like mm -hmm. I wanted one when they were younger. Or when <laughs> <I was younger. laughs> um, what else? What comes next? The title. So the, the term that you search right. for. All right. All right, now here's a hard question. Underneath the title or the word that you are looking up, what's the menu that sits right under it? Does yeah. any of you know? But the outline of the all the things that are in there. That's on the left hand menu, yeah. the it's vertical the menu. But what is what runs ver uh, horizontally across under the title? Alternate names, alternate in case you pick the wrong person or the wrong disambiguous. When we talk about where we place things and how we control what people see, it has to do with emphasis and what we don't emphasize. So let's take a look and see what's there, what's always there. Under the title of plain language, there's a menu right here, but if you're not actively working to edit and work on Wikipedia entries, you probably skip over it every time you come to this page. This is the article. This is where people can talk about the content that maybe should be in the article and over here, we can become an editor and we can look at the history of where this page has changed. Have you ever clicked on those? Some of you have, okay. I've clicked on them just for fun. I haven't edited anything yet. But this is small. And this is just one example of how this is made so that for most people, you're gonna skip right over it. And you're gonna get to the meat of the article itself. Someone is controlling what we pay attention to and what we don't pay attention to. I'm going to go ahead and talk about the review process for writing, um, and then we'll take another quick break and see what you've seen in the writing, uh, in the, as far as ethics in the writing process. So for after we get our writing done, we may do some usability testing, and then we're going to go through an editing process. Usability testing with target users is completed to determine if the information is accurate, complete, clear, accessible, easy to navigate. I can give you an example. Um, I took one of my Canvas courses and I had a student act as a user to user test something. This was many years ago. I just wanted to know what their experience was like clicking around in my course. I wanna make sure they can do what I want them to do. I was so surprised by what happened. The student went to click on a document that would open. It opened in a new page, a new browser page. When they finished working with the document that opened, they wanted to go back to Canvas. They did not realize that the page had opened a new browser page. They could not figure out how to go back to Canvas because there's no back button. And they got so frustrated that they closed the web browser completely. 
that let me know that when documents open in a new page, it's helpful for me, for some students, to let them know this will open in a new browser page. Hopefully they'll see that message. And I doubt not, you know, not all students would react that way, but this one student did. And I was so surprised, but glad that I saw that. So user testing is just watching people interact with whatever you have created or designed to see how it's working. Is it successful? And then we've got the editing phase. Depending on how much time and how much money, that's going to determine how well this happens. Are facts going to be checked? Are sources going to be verified? How thorough of an editing process is this going to go through? When it comes to usability testing and editing, I'll just I'll assume that you can agree with me on this. You've all had an experience where you've worked with instructions for building something and you have wondered how the heck did they get from this step to this step because it's not happening for me. And that's because usability testing maybe did not happen or something in the editing process was skipped over. This is an important aspect of the principal writing process. Okay, so I'm gonna pause right there and I'm gonna throw it back to you to see where else in the writing process do you see ethical considerations needing to happen? And you can focus on writing um, or you can focus on that review process. Any thoughts standing out? So I would say the style of transparency as well because you can be more how you're choosing the word choices that you're making for any clients to so that you're not misunderstood in order for that to be to make sure that it's as transparent as possible. Because we can write in ways that that are completely unclear if we want to can we? we can use passive voice we can use language that's unclear we can make it really hard for someone to understand something but we don't want to do that we want to be transparent speaking of transparency and an easy example i give in uh, my classes and this has to do with visual rhetoric too but when you're looking at legal documents for let's say purchasing of something that's expensive a car or what have you. What's the warranty information look like? Words, no lines. Big words. <laughs> Big words, small print. <laughs> okay, so are we are they being very transparent with the warranty and what it actually covers? Right? It feels like that's always an issue. We expect that to be a mess, and it almost always is. From the uh in the fact gathering process before writing would be another uh, time to consider ethics. Um, we don't, didn't pull out a specific principle here, but. Okay, thank you. I was gonna say along those lines of the style that you know, leads into the, the style guide as well as the, the that idea of fairness to respect too, because you're wanting to think about um, who your audience is and are you communicating in a fair manner, like when you talk about those car warranties, that is not fair, right? I am not a law student, law lawyer, and you know, I'm not going to be able to read it, and I'm going to ignore that. And so the ethical behavior there, well, that's kind of on purpose. Well, why is it on purpose, right? So I, I think about the fairness and respect of, of the audience as well. Those things. I think that interacts really interestingly and oddly with like. The code of law or the rule of law here, and it's like, yeah, it's legal. It's kind of like malicious intent, though, that would make it <laughs> impossible to read. Yeah, we're going to comply with the law. But... On the flip side, right? Though, if something did happen to you, or you know, the, the company kind of protects themselves, right? And so, like, they have to write in a certain way so that now that it affects you, and now that you go down and read down certain things, they're protected as well. So, I think it. Trying to include both is is tough because if you leave out a word or a sentence that's really important, um, or even paragraphs, then they can come and count you later on. So it's like a well, I meant count it, but not mm -hmm. use it. So I read a for my for this class that I'm taking right now. I read a code of ethics of a religious school. I purposely picked that just to see how they wrote theirs, and they started off with like Bible verses, which straight you know, and I was just like. 
it was kind of like, and, and I, I'm a person of faith, but I can see how a person not of faith would be turned off, right? Because it started off, you could have said the sentence without referring to the Bible verse, um, but it was just interesting. But then at the same time, if you pick to go to that school and you know it's a super duper Christian school, you kind of knew that, that going in, right? So um, I think it's like when you buy a car, right? You know there's going to be some warranty information you don't want to read. But you need the car. So like we went to that school, but it was written in a way that was tough for me to get through. Um, and that's from a person of faith. Like, so I can imagine a person who wasn't as strong of faith to read that. Uh, that's a great example because you're, you're pointing out how tough it can be for any employee to do their job, protect the interests of whomever they work for, but also give information to whomever they're writing for that's going to work for them too. So balancing both of those. I was going to say that is an amazing example when we think about who we're speaking to, because you're exactly right. Like, I'm not a person of faith that would turn me off. I would immediately be like, that is not a school for my kids. Absolutely not. So they're doing an amazing job of screening just with the maybe that's their goal. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great example. And on the other side, you wouldn't want to be cool. Right? Yeah. So, so there's no way you could be to replace that truth. For example, or something else, well, then it might be creating a false right? representation. Yeah. That's really what that school represents. So mm-hmm. it is a, it's a balancing act, you know, for sure. I actually, for, if that one in detail specifically to see if they included like, the community of LGBT, LGBT community, right. and they did. Mm-hmm. Then if you're like super duper faith, uh, faith and, and that's when you go up, right? So it was just like yeah, it's two two it's, edges. I was just like, well, it's included in there, so like now now you guys determine whether you want to let the kids go if you go out religious if you're against it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. so I mean, it was just super interesting to read. And I think that becomes like a ethical dilemma on the school because they need they, they need the students, right? And they need you know them to open it to everybody. So it was just interesting to read to see that. It's a great example. It's a great oh my gosh, sorry. <laughs> like also the funding sources, right? Like if they want to get public money, they have to be fair to everyone. But this is also you're right. Like would a parent who's anti LGBT ever allow their child to go there, or would a child who was LGBT choose to go there? And why are they putting both of those really seeming incompatible aspects together? And then, and viability <laughs> create long term value for all relevant stakeholders. We're trying to touch on all of those. Mm-hmm. Any other ideas before we move on to our case study? Well, I was correct. I was thinking too with that, you know, what's the follow up? You know, like going back to the car warranty, you know, is the salesman communicating what I need to know about this warranty that I'm not understanding? And is that legit? Is that going to be transparent about that warranty? Same with the school, you know, who are the admin people and are they explaining or, you know, those kinds of things and how that works? Or is there, a, 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 you know, frequently asked questions or, you know, do we go beyond in explaining how those two are working together, right? So, like, where are the boundaries when it comes to communicating in the right? I would love a recently asked question. <laughs> All of the more things that we have. All right, thank you guys for, for looking at the writing process with me and picking out some things. We're going to move along to the mini case study. All right, so based on the examples that I've given and you have brought up, um, a few ideas that I think we can agree on. First of all, communication is power. It holds power. Everything is an argument. You might think that technical writing is just facts, but it is an argument because it's motivated, it's manipulated, it's shaped. And so it's not just facts. It is always an argument with the intent to help, again, technical writing. I'm designing this so that an audience can do something, make a decision, act. So this is not just facts. Facts alone may not do that. I'm designing this to help you do something and see something in a certain way. And finally, it's always about people. Someone created it. Someone's consuming it. It is always about people. And we're going to see that um, as it's true in the case study. All right. So with the limited time we have left, um, I hope that you can stick around for this. 
The Challenger case study is one that you often see in technical writing um, introductory courses. A little bit of background information is what I'm going to give you first. I'm going to play an eight minute video. And the reason I, one of the reasons I want to play the video is to give you more context and also to meet um, briefly the seven astronauts who were on the space shuttle. It's, it's not respectful for me to talk about this case study without us learning about the people who lost their lives um, that resulted in this being a case study for us. Um, so the Space Shuttle Challenger was a shuttle orbiter operated by NASA. In 1983, it was launched several times successfully, beginning in 83. It actually orbited the Earth almost a thousand times throughout those many launches. However, design flaws in the rocket boosters were documented as early as 77, again in 79, again in 83, and again in 85, even just a few months before its final launch. Roger Beaujolais was an engineer with Morton Thiokol. Morton Thiokol is the engineering company who created the boosters themselves. They're located in uh, Utah. He documented the design flaw, which was something called an O-ring. Uh, uh, the O-ring was a little rubber gasket um, he documented this failure in a memo to his supervisor along with a warning. You have a copy of this memo in front of you. Engineers were really concerned about the cold temperatures the night before the launch. Even though it was Florida, it actually got really cold that night. What happens to rubber that's kind of soft when it gets when it freezes? We have a problem. And we're not, I'm not an engineer, <laughs> but we have a problem, right? Uh, the 10th launch of the Challenger on January 28th, 1986. I was 10 years old, uh, fourth grade, from Kennedy Space Center, resulted in destruction of the shuttle 73 seconds after liftoff, killing all seven of the astronauts on board. So I'm going to play a clip of the news that. Uh, you guys know that it still airs today, 2020. You've heard of that new show, perhaps. Uh, this was a clip from 2020 that aired in the months following the explosion, and they're going to talk about some of the things that led to it, okay? So from the video, I hope that you have a little bit more context to think about the conversations that were happening apart from the memo that Roger wrote. I know it stands out to me from the video that they were told to take off their engineering hat and put on a management hat. I'm aware that at this time in NASA's history, they were sending things into space at a rapid pace. So quickly that engineers um, were waiting on something to come back so they could pillage parts, put them in something else, and get it out to space on time because they had just a really rigorous launch schedule. NASA was not willing to be told that we can't launch this right now for safety. Um, but at Morton Fire Call itself, that's where we have the engineers who were working. So I'm going to ask you to uh, take just a quick second, if you haven't already, skim through the memo that Roger wrote. And I'd like to know what stands out to you, what language stands out, or what writing. No, if it's just a memo, it contains technical information. Um, engineers participate in technical writing uh, every day. You can think about it that way. I mean, it's pretty technical. Like, I don't understand it. I understand each word individually, but like, you can see that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can feel it. Like, they asking for a team just to solve a problem instead of saying that this don't so, stop the yeah, project yeah, that, you yeah, know yeah. which I, yeah. I think it's interesting that the result would be a practically at the highest order of loss of human life is buried on the it's on the back page versus like that my mind would be the subject right not potential over, over, yeah yeah, yeah. over yeah. erosion yes they have potential failure criticality but the actual Potential loss of human life. No, I, I get it. You say, like, we're going to launch people in space that this comes with. 
Uh, I think you're going to hear this. Uh, I have another two minute quick video to share with you. Um, but you touched on it and thinking like a manager the man, in, in those critical discussions that happened the night before the launch and then the morning of management at NASA and then even at Martin High Call, instead of saying, prove to me that this is going to be successful, which is the stance they would normally take, they said, we have a success record. Prove to me that it's going to fail, which is essentially impossible. They could not prove that it absolutely was going to fail. But that is what the engineers were told to do. And they could not argue against that. In technical writing textbook for this case study is touched on. You guys all noticed it. Um, it's trying to bound things for your audience. But the one that most people point to is, gosh, that phrase, loss of life, as you said, doesn't happen until way down further. When we think about direct or indirect approaches to our writing and where we bury information, it feels a little buried. Now, am I going to go back here and I'm gonna, am I going to say to Roger Beaujolais, you acted unethically? I would not fault Roger. Some people did. Some people have. Because we always want someone to blame. Um, but the real fault Lies elsewhere, right? Let's take a quick look at one more thing. I think I've already touched on some of these. The fact that um, corrosion occurring in freezing temps could not be counted on as predicting failure. They couldn't say for sure that that would happen. Um, and the physical issue was the O-ring, but the complicating factors that you've learned from watching this content. Organizational barriers that prevented effective communication of critical safety information. All of the times that the O-ring had been documented prior were in safety reports, which were definitely more technical type documents than this memo. Um, there had been a few memos, but um, the differences of opinion and the ways that engineers' opinions were respected among management, that was one of the key issues. And that was some of the unethical actions that were uncovered through the presidential commission, the hearings that they held after um, the space shuttle destructed. That presidential hearing was kind of what led to the change in Roger's life as well. He is known now as a whistleblower and an ethics champion. While after the launch, uh, Morton Thiokol, while they publicly assigned Roger to a redesign team for the rocket boosters, he was privately isolated from working on the project. That's what he communicated in his interview since then. He was not allowed to touch anything else in his role. When the presidential commission hearings were publicly released, his honesty Testimony resulted in a lot of damage to Morton Thiokol and to NASA. Um, he and his colleagues at the time were blamed for all of that fallout. Um, his contract ended for whatever reason um, in early 1987. So that was just a year after the launch itself. For his honesty and integrity leading up to and following the shuttle disaster, he did receive the award for scientific freedom and responsibility from the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 1988. And while he did not work as an engineer for the rest of his life, he actually really struggled with what happened personally. Um, he then spent many years visiting um, schools of engineering and talking about ethics and what it means to be a whistleblower. So I'm just going to play a two-minute clip of him at a college of engineering talking about um, ethics and his experiences. Any questions you have? I don't know if you've seen it before. I got to do this in a totally different aspect. They gave us all like the scenarios and like you were the engineer, you were the manager, you were whatever, and it was a car race, right? And they gave you all these stats and like you were like, do we do, do we go race? If we do, the engines blow and 
or lose all our sponsors. Like they changed the scenario, but it was exactly the challenger. And so like everybody had their piece and the engineer had to say, no, like you can't do this. And the manager had that. And it was kind of cool to see how we all decided what we were going to do as a team with peer pressure. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, they were like, what if we told you that this is exactly what happened with the challenger and all of us were like, Ooh. Like it was really tough because you were just looking at a car race um, and obviously the, the, the stakes are lower than the loss of life, but you know what, we're making the decision. It's pretty cool to, to, to work through that. So, yeah. Roger said that people have asked him, you know, why didn't you do more? Why just stop at a memo? Why didn't you go banging on someone's door and say, we cannot do this? And he said, if I had done anything more than what I did, they would have sent his words. They would have sent the men in white coats to my office immediately, and that was in the end of me. Now he ended up losing his job anyway, right? But again, I think we can look at what he wrote. Yeah, we can take it apart. We can pick apart your writing. I think so much passive voice in there that I would say we need to change this. Maybe that would help. But I don't think in this situation it was the technical writing itself. It was the larger culture that needed attention and through the presidential hearing and those being made public um, from that commission, changes hopefully did happen uh, at what well, Morton High Hall eventually folded and NASA, we hope that some changes were made. They said that changes were made. Launches were definitely paused for quite some time. I imagine there, there's almost a sense of gaslighting throughout that process. The folks who really tried to stay and then were told or were made to feel this was your fault. You know, you didn't do enough. You know, that's not how it happened. Yeah. I think we can't underestimate the, uh, the government. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but the government sort of lack of care for an individual person, right? Like the the overarching uh, launch of the shuttle with the teacher on board, the advertising and what that shows the world was so much bigger than the life of each of those seven people. I almost thought that in this memo, when he talked about destroying the, losing the flight along with the launch pad facility, like the fifth little note was to me, because it's a business, it, it's something that we can't take out of the equation as well. We would all say, oh, yes, we're so about human life. That was only seven people. I can't believe that I'm a social worker and I'm saying that, but to a government that's responsible for hundreds of millions of people, like, I mean, unimportant. And there was like a race between like us and Russia and everything else going on with space. Yeah, we get finally that. caught up and they were trying to make, I think too, that there's some ethical considerations around being a whistleblower because there are severe risks and rewards in his story too that come, you know, and so we're, we're you know, thinking about an individual ethical decision when I know something's wrong. To what risk am I willing to go ahead and go that whistle? On the flip side, let's just say Roger was always whistleblowing and nothing ever happened, right? Mm -hmm. Like, let's say he's right. always like, hey, we don't fix this. It's because I worked with an engineer that did right. that. The world is like coming to the end every right. time on every project. And eventually, like, that's just built off. Right, right, right yeah. And so he, I've never been able to research anything to see if that was his persona. I don't think it was because it would have probably. For the long blast, like well, he always made up things, but that's another aspect that could be like you have some engineers that they're always like the world, you know, they do it more for a CYA mm -hmm. than for themselves, and so uh, that's tough because they know they really were supported, they just have interest, you know. From, from the testimonies and things that I've read, Roger did not appear to be that way. Yeah. And if you're interested, one of the engineers he worked with, Paul Evelyn, he was another person who, I guess, received some media attention. He and Roger were both confidential informants to National Public Radio right after the shuttle exploded. And they helped give some information that later in life, they gave interviews you know, on the record to ECR. Um, and Paul, another year, his life really fell apart. And in his later years, he was racked with guilt. His life. And he even said uh, on air, I think this is so sad, he said, God chose a loser. 
because he felt like it was his fault. And after that aired, not only did people write in to the show, showing so much support for him, but some of the managers who made the call that he hadn't heard from since the launch reached out to him and said, you did everything. And that changed his um that changed his later years. His family even said they they did a piece on him when he passed and his family said that interview and the way that it that the feedback he received made his last few years so much better. And he was able to let go of some of that guilt. Right. Well, I don't know if it was him or Roger, um, but I think there was a, a piece about them where they would go back to to the area where the spring was over and over and over and over trying to find something to make sense of what happened. In years of going back to the free area, same thing as I mean, they were haunted. And so full disclosure, I, I teach in TechCom, but I teach it on uh, emotional intelligence in TechCom. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that is undervalued and uh, under discussed is, is the emotional impact of ethics or lack of um, and decision making. And in rhetoric, outside like ancient rhetoric, one of the principles is you're never going to persuade the facts. Facts don't do anything. Emotions do it. Right? Because if I tell you my car holds 14 gallons of gas, that's a fact. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> right? You have to place it into meaningful context, which comes with emotion. Um, and so the emotional impact of making them right? Or not making Right, is, is part of the mix. And, and you see that in the memos, you see it in the context. Um, and unless we understand the fact that the worst case scenario means that not only is there a loss of life, but now there's seven families. And that trauma is generational, right? It doesn't just end with them, it's a generational trauma. Their spouses, their kids, all of it, with that all of it, right? Um, and then them impacted, again, generational trauma, right? Um, and we want to kind of ignore that, like that's not efficient, <laughs> it's not monetary, um, but that's the reality of impacted lives, right? We're human beings. Um, so to, that to me is an interesting piece that um, goes beyond just the openness, right? Like the ethical decisions, I mean, emotional impact that be traumatic and generational. I hope that this example of the memo uh, that Roger wrote again communicates the strong beliefs I have, as I mentioned to you already, that communication is power. Everything is an argument, and it's always about people, even that. <laughs>